And here we are. So, uh, again, kind of short chapters, uh, especially the last one, which is really just kind of an epilogue uh, where he returns to the you know, author's first person narration as we had in the very first chapter. Um, but in the meantime, we find out about the end of poor dear Valencia. So if you remember from last time, <clears throat> Billy uh, went on that, that optometrist's trip. The plane crashed, <clears throat> everyone died, but Billy, including his stepfather. Um, so Billy's in the hospital Valencia is headed off to see him. We're shown Valencia as a dedicated wife. She is very concerned about Billy's well being. It's a pretty stark contrast to Billy himself, who uh, doesn't really show concern for anyone's well being. Uh, Again, he's this sort of Marceau character. Uh, in any case, as she's driving to the hospital to see him, <clears throat> she gets into an accident. A Mercedes slams into her car from behind. Nobody was hurt, thank God. Both drivers were wearing seatbelts. The Mercedes lost a headlight, but the rear end of the Cadillac was a body and fender man's wet dream. They're talking about the guy who would fix the the car, the body and fender man. Uh, he'd be happy to charge lots of money is the implication. The trunk and fenders were collapsed. The gaping trunk looked like the mouth of a village idiot who was explaining that he didn't know anything about anything. <laughs> the fenders shrugged. The fender, I don't know, uh, you guys know what they're talking about there? That's uh, the part on the car in the front and the back that protects it. Those are the fender. Think defender. Because when I was a little kid, that's what I thought they were, <laughs> defenders. Uh, I'd always heard the fender, sounds like a defender. Um, the fenders shrugged. The bumper sticker, sorry, the bumper was at high port arms, <laughs> like guiding a ship into port. Reagan for president, a sticker on the bumper said. That's kind of funny too. Um, <clears throat> there are a few political allusions in, in the book. This is one of them. That means that Billy, well, probably not so much Billy as Valencia, is a Reagan Republican. I don't think we'll get too much into what that means. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense because they're well off. You know, they have they have money, so there's a good chance they're they're Republicans. Uh, what was the, the earlier in the book? There's some mention of the of somebody. <laughs> Somebody from the like the John Birch Society, but it slips my mind right now. Um, those were, let's say, a bit more openly racist conservatives in the 1960s, and I think earlier too. Uh, eventually, they had to be kind of rooted out of the Republican Party for uh, the fact that they kind of had a bad effect on their electability. Okay, anyway, when she arrived at the hospital, people rushed to the windows to see what all the noise was. The Cadillac sounded like a heavy bomber because the muffler was gone. That's the part that makes the engine quieter. Oh yeah, this is a key detail. The exhaust system rested on the pavement, backtracking one sentence. So the accident had knocked out the exhaust system. <coughs> Valencia turned off the engine, but then she slumped against the steering wheel. The horn brayed steadily. So it made this beep sound. Uh, a doctor and a nurse ran out to find what the trouble was. Poor Valencia was unconscious, overcome by uh, carbon monoxide. She was a heavenly azure. That would be blue. An hour later, she was dead. So it goes. So poor Valencia. Now, as far as why this is in the book, you know, again, it's just it's just, just to give us that contrast between Billy, who uh, 
we already established he just kind of got married to her because he could see the future and he saw that life with her would be the most tolerable option. Uh, not a ringing endorsement of their marriage. Besides, he's got a space wife too. <laughs> uh, Billy knew nothing about his wife's passing. He was in the hospital. Uh, he dreamed on and traveled in time and so forth. The hospital was so crowded, uh, Billy couldn't have a room to himself. He shared a room with Harvard history professor named Bertram Copeland Rumford. Now, I put this picture up here because uh, you may or may not know that uh, Wiles, Wiles, Winston Niles Rumford is the central character of the book Sirens of Titan, uh, another great Kurt Vonnegut book, one of my faves. Um, it's never revealed in any other book that I know of what their relation is. Like, if the, is this, I, I guess it would be his father, just because in, in this book, he's 70. Um, it's interesting, though. There's, you know, constant crossover between Vonnegut novels. Uh, it's a great book if you have a chance to read it. It's, a, it's also science fiction, but it's comical, and it has, you know, philosophical parts to it. Um, and it has similar themes of being scattered through time. That is another thing that happens in Sirens of Titan. Also, this dog, this dog is named Kazak, and this dog appears in other books too, <laughs> as a different dog also named Kazak. Uh, but I think sometimes he's a Doberman. I don't know. It could be that Kurt Vonnegut is just using the same names, and it's not meant to be a meaningful crossover, but I like to think that it is a meaningful crossover. Uh, not that like he just likes to use the same names. So yes, this would be them uh, on Titan. It's like a moon of Saturn. Uh, okay. Anyway, yeah, Billy shared a room with maybe the father of Winston Niles Rumford. Uh, Rumford didn't have to look at Billy because Billy's behind white linens. Uh, Rumford could hear Billy talking to himself. Uh, so we find out that Bertram, he, he doesn't like Billy at all. So let's talk about why do you think <clears throat> Bertram dislikes Billy so much? He shows contempt for Billy. He quotes, uh, Roosevelt, I think, and says, I could carve a better man out of a banana. <laughs> Why is that? Anyone want to wager a guess? Mm -hmm. He's rich by birth, perhaps. Uh... But so is Bertram. Both of them are rich. Oh, wait. Actually, are you saying that Bertram is rich by birth and that's why? Yes. Uh, maybe. Yeah, it could be a class thing. That's true. Yeah, Bertram is born rich. Uh, actually, Billy isn't born rich. I take it back. Billy becomes rich later on. He's well off now, uh, as in rich. He doesn't hurt financially. Um, that's, yeah, that's probably a part of it. In fact, you could imagine that Bertram probably feels contempt for a lot of people <laughs> uh, by that same virtue of, of being old money. Um, yeah, we find out other things about Bertram. He's uh, the Air Force historian. He's a professor who's written 27 books. Uh, he's one of the top com competitive sailors in the entire world. Uh, so he's a high achiever. And uh, yeah, so yeah, he probably feels contempt for a lot of people. There's also the fact that uh, Billy seems entirely pathetic um in his sleep bertram notices billy constantly surrenders <laughs> which is his thing you know he's like i give up or like just leave without me guys he's always saying those things because those are the things that happened to him 
and yes, happened to him would be the appropriate way of describing his life. Billy is someone whose life happened to him. <laughs> uh, it's not as if he, it's, uh, he's, he's not a participant. <laughs> he's just along for the ride. Um, okay. Yes. Of course, Bertram doesn't know that part. He eventually gets to know Billy a little bit better. Uh, it's funny, they thought that Billy was comatose after the, the accident, but it's just like he didn't have anything to say. He gave him diagnosis, echolalia. Yes, yes. He says he has echolalia. He's just repeating everything he says. Uh, and yeah, he just, <laughs> he says, are we supposed to get a doctor for this man? Is that even a man anymore? I think I put that up here somewhere. Um, and yeah, Billy just doesn't have anything to say. It's like that, uh, <laughs> there's that Montenegrin joke about the Montenegrin like baby who never said anything. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Like his whole life, he never said anything. He was just really quiet. He didn't cry or anything. And then one day <laughs> when he's like I don't know, a teenager, he says, can you pass the salt? And they're like, whoa, you spoke. Why didn't you say anything before? And he was like, everything was okay. <laughs> there was no problem. Uh, I hope that nobody finds that offensive. <laughs> it's a joke that I heard. Um, yeah, Billy's kind of like that. <laughs> he doesn't say anything because he just doesn't have anything to say. It's not because of the car or the plane wreck. He's just quiet. Um, and she thought uh, that he doesn't uh, deserve to live. It's better for him to be dead. Yeah, well, that you mean that's what, uh, what's his name said? <laughs> the Damn it, I've forgotten his name, excuse me. Bertram, Bertram. You mean Bertram? Yes. Yeah, yeah. He says, why do we waste doctors on this person? He said he should go to a vet <laughs> instead, like a veterinarian. <laughs> uh, so Billy had to miss his wife's funeral because of the, because of the plane crash. He was conscious, though, while Valencia was being put into the ground in Ilium. Billy hadn't said much since regaining consciousness, hadn't responded very elaborately to the news uh, of Valencia's death and Robert's coming home. Robert is his son, the Green Beret, from the war. So it was generally believed that he was a vegetable. There was talk of performing an operation on him later, one which might improve the circulation of blood to his brain. Okay, so they really think that he's <clears throat> a vegetable. His outward listlessness was a screen. The listlessness concealed a mind which was fizzling, fizzing and flashing thrillingly. It was preparing letters and lectures about flying saucers, the negligibility of death and the true nature of time. So as much as he looks like a vegetable inside, he's uh, going through all kinds of phases, flying through time. Uh, Professor Rumfer said frightful things. Oh yeah, here's where he says. He says terrible things about Billy and Billy hears too. Uh, why don't they let him die? He asked Lily. Lily is his very young girlfriend. Professor Rumford is 70 and he's got some 20 something year old girlfriend. I don't know, she said. That's not a human being anymore. Doctors are for human beings. They should turn him over to a veterinarian or a tree surgeon. <laughs> he's a plant. They'd know what to do, look at him. That's life, according to the medical profession. Isn't life wonderful? So you have to imagine he's being very sarcastic there. I don't know, says Lily. Um, <clears throat> so you could imagine that uh, Professor Rumford, uh, <laughs> he would be just cool with euthanizing people. <laughs> he seems to be uh, someone who would be. Um, yeah, just put him under. This is not a human life, he's saying. <clears throat> uh, Rumford talked to Lily about the bombing of Dresden one time, and Billy heard it. Rumford had a problem about Dresden. His one volume history of the Air Force, the Army Air Force in World War II, was supposed to be a readable condensation of the 27 volume official history of the Air Force in World War II. The thing was, though, there was almost nothing about the Dresden raid, even though. 
It had been such a, a howling success. The extent of the success had been kept secret for many years after the war. A secret from the American people. It was no secret from the Germans, of course, or from the Russians who occupied Dresden after the war, who are in Dresden still. So the people who died there, basically. Um, so we get the idea. He's furious that the smashing success of this bombing is not uh, widely discussed, I guess. Um, but it seems clear. Well, I mean, it says directly that this is a kept secret. Why would they keep it a secret? For fear of a lot of bleeding hearts. Uh, bleeding heart is a kind of derogatory term that's used for somebody who uh, shows too much sympathy for other people. <laughs> uh, fear that a lot of bleeding hearts might not think it was such a wonderful thing to do. By the way, it's uh, notable that at the time of the bombing, you know, even our allies were questioning the the need for that that bombing. It seemed like overkill. <clears throat> I mean, Churchill even questioned the bombing. He was like, "Whoa, guys! Hey, the war is ending." Um, I, I mean, he didn't just question it. I think he said something directly against it. It wasn't just questioning, like maybe we shouldn't have done that. It was, that was not the right thing to do. Anyway, uh, yeah, here's the echolalia part. It was now that Billy spoke up. I was there. He's simply echoing things we say. Oh, he's got echolalia now. Oh, <laughs> that's Lily repeating herself, not, not Billy. Echolalia is a mental disease which makes people immediately repeat things uh, that well people around them say. But Billy didn't really have it. Rumford simply insisted for his own comfort that Billy had it. Rumford was thinking in a military manner that an inconvenient person, one whose death he wished for very much for practical reasons, was suffering from a repulsive disease. That's pretty telling. Uh, yeah, yeah. Billy's presence is inconvenient for him. Uh, he's not a fan. <laughs> All right, nothing more was said about Dresden that night. And as he closed his eyes, he traveled in time to a May afternoon, two days after the Second World War in Europe. Billy and five other American prisoners were riding in a coffin-shaped green wagon, which they had found abandoned, complete with two horses in the suburb of Dresden. Now they're being drawn by the clop, clop, clopping horses down narrow lanes, which had been cleared through the moon-like ruins. He frequently, as you recall, compares Dresden to it alien planet. Uh, they were going back to the slaughterhouse for souvenirs of the war. Uh, that's uh, a thread that runs throughout here. People looting and everyone comes away from the war with something. Uh, so this is for <laughs> their chance to go and get something cool. <laughs> Billy was reminded of the sound <clears throat> of milkmen's horses early in the morning in Ilium when he was a boy. Uh, yes, horse-drawn milkman. Slightly before my time. Billy sat in the back of the jiggling coffin. His head was tilted back and his nostrils were flaring. He was happy. Okay, so yeah, it comes up again in a second. That this is, for him, the high point of his life, on Earth anyway. <laughs> He's happy that to, to be riding along. Hi, doggy. <laughs> to be riding along. <laughs> it's okay. In the back of this cart. Um, yeah, there was food in the wagon and wine and a camera and a stamp collection and a stuffed owl and a mantle clock that ran on changes of barometric pressure. Basically loot. The Americans had gone into empty houses in the suburb where they had been imprisoned and they had taken these and many other things. Okay, so looting. Uh, Billy stayed in the wagon when they reached the slaughterhouse, <coughs> sunning himself. The others went in looking for souvenirs. Later in life, the Trophimadorians would advise him to concentrate on moments like that <laughs> to make this a little bit shorter. 
yes, this is for him a pretty moment. Uh, so this would be a nice part of the mountain range to focus on in trying to deal with uh, stress, I guess, if he needs to relax. This is one of the relaxing points in his life. Stare at the pretty things as eternity failed to go by. If this sort of selectivity had been possible for Billy, he might have chosen as his happiest moment his sun-drenched snooze in the back of the wagon. So that's the moment. Um, <clears throat> so they come across a couple of Germans, as it says, speaking in pitying tones. He hears them commiserating, sharing their sorrows with someone lyrically. Before Billy opened his eyes, it seemed to him the tones might have been those used by friends of Jesus when they took his ruined body from the cross. So it goes. Uh, so on the side of the road, they see these two uh, Germans, this German couple, <clears throat> middle-aged man and wife. They noticed that the horses were being terribly abused. I mean, not in a separate case from what's happening, like not abused, like beaten, but they're not being taken care of. Their mouths were bleeding, gashed by the bits. <clears throat> the bit is the metal part that goes in the horse's mouth, gashed by the bits. Uh, the horse's hooves were broken, so every step meant agony. They were insane with thirst. The Americans had treated their horse like horses like a car. Um, the German couple had nine languages between them. They tried Polish on Billy first since he was dressed so clownishly. <laughs> the wretched Poles were the involuntary clowns of the Se Second World War. <clears throat> There's that story of the Polish cavalry. Do you guys know about that? Charging the German tanks with, with horses. Um, they didn't have a, an updated army. <laughs> um, Billy asked them in English what it was they wanted, <clears throat> and they scolded him for the condition of the horses. Billy gets out of the wagon and looks at the horses, and he bursts into tears. He hadn't cried about anything else in the war. Okay. Billy bursts into tears. Now, let's talk about that. Well, first this. Uh, yeah, there's this part about the epigraph of the book. Uh, this uh, part of A Christmas Carol is included. And yeah, Billy cried very little, though he often saw things worth crying about. And in that respect, he resembled Christ of the Carol. So the baby Christ in the Christmas Carol, the cattle are lowing, the baby awakes, but little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. An odd comparison, comparing Billy to Christ. I guess it's ironic comparison because Billy doesn't care about anything. Um, maybe it's not right for me to say that he doesn't care about anything. Maybe it'd be more accurate to say that he sees everything. So maybe it could be Christ-like. <laughs> um, but he sees everything and that makes him dispassionate instead of passionate, right? I guess that would be the difference. <clears throat> um, so why are the horses the straw that broke the camel's back for Billy? If you're not familiar with that idiom, I think you are. I think it's the same, it's also biblical. <laughs> um, the, the thing that made him break down was the horses. Why? Why do you think? There's no wrong answer here. <laughs> Why do you think the horses make Billy cry when he doesn't cry about anything? I Look, I also, I understand having sympathy for animals. <laughs> uh, you know, humans can be really cruel to each other. Um, animals people sometimes mm -hmm. uh, prefer animals than than other people. He could. He could. That might be it. I mean, but he would also see that the horses are alive someplace else um, because he's outside of time. <clears throat> I mean, that the horses are not suffering, I guess, having a normal life. Um, but think about it. How are the horses like Billy?
Yeah. The horses don't get a choice in, in what's happening, right? They, Billy is, he was previously described, or had uh, the Trophimidorians described for him the way that they see humans in the third dimension as being, the way they explained it to him, as being strapped onto a railroad track, looking through a tube at a, you know, through a small hole, only able to look forward. Uh, right? I mean, that, that, that seems to be, I don't know, that seems to me to be, a, he feels sympathy for them because they're like him. <laughs> that's, that's my theory anyway, that uh, he, he sympathizes with the fact that they don't have any choice and uh, life is something that happens to them in the same way that life is something that happens to him, even though Billy is most of the time pretty cool with it. Um, so yeah, he has a lot in common with them. I also thought about Nietzsche. Yes. You're, uh, you're muted. You're muted. Can you hear me? Okay. No? Uh, yeah. Okay. You must have two, uh, okay. yeah. Ah, oh, there we go. Oh, if you have uh, two devices, you get feedback. Um, hey, there you go. Do you want to try again? Is it okay now? Yes. No? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you want to say something? All right. Uh, okay. In that case, let's uh, go forward. Um, so yes, the story ended this way. Billy and the doctors. Okay. Oh. Yeah. It's that that whole feedback thing. Okay. Billy and the doctors unharnessed the horses. Horses wouldn't go anywhere. Their feet hurt too much. Oh yeah, I wanted to say this. Uh, there are two things that strike my imagination here or my memory at least. Uh, there's the story about the moment that Friedrich Nietzsche lost his mind. Do you guys know about that? Uh, you know how he finished off his life as a kind of lunatic probably uh, because of an infection in his brain, but lots of theories. Um, but the moment that he cracked uh, happened in Turin, where he saw a horse being mistreated, and it caused him to burst into tears. And he went and, and hugged the horse and defended it. It reminded me of that. I don't think that that Kurt Vonnegut is trying to make an allusion to uh, to Nietzsche, but who knows? I don't see Billy Pilgrim as a particularly Nietzschean character, <laughs> so I guess it's just uh, something that struck me. Uh, but there's also a theme here where the, the horses can't go anywhere um, because their feet hurt too much. Uh, mm -hmm. And the Russians came on motorcycles and they arrested everybody but the horses. <clears throat> there's a, a part of the Kurt Vonnegut book, Mother Night, that we discussed earlier. Uh, when, uh, ah, what's his name? I can't remember his name, the main character. At some point he realizes that he can't go anywhere, that there's no place, there's nothing in the universe pushing him to move in any direction. And he winds up paralyzed with no place to go just because there's no place to go. <laughs> um, it's kind of a contrast to the horses who, they have a reason not to go anywhere and that's the pain. Anyway, <clears throat> Two days after that, Billy was turned over to the Americans who shipped him home on a slow freighter called the Lucretia Mott. <clears throat> Lucretia was a famous American suffragette. She was dead, so it goes. <laughs> uh, he starts getting a little bit funnier with the uses of so it goes. 
uh, suffragettes were uh, people, who, ladies who fought for uh, women's suffrage, which meant the right to vote, not to be confused with suffering. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is the conversation now back with uh, <clears throat> with Rumford and Billy in the hospital. Uh, it had to be done. Speaking of the destruction of Dresden, I know, says Billy. That's war. I know. I'm not complaining. It must have been hell on the ground. It was. Pity the men who had to do it. I do. <laughs> There's this, uh, the thing at the beginning where Kurt Vonnegut is talking about uh, being at a party and having some drinks and talking to someone and telling them that he was there for the bombing of Dresden. And the guy immediately starts talking about all the terrible things the Germans did. And all that Kurt Vonnegut can say is, I know, I know. <laughs> this is like that scene, except he's in a hospital and he's Billy Pilgrim and uh, he's a bit, a bit more passive. <laughs> um, you must have had mixed feelings there on the ground. <clears throat> it was all right, said Billy. Everything's all right. And everybody has to do exactly what he does. I learned that on Trafambador. I We don't get the reaction <laughs> of Professor Rumford to this, although I imagine it would be pretty funny. Uh, I mean, he, uh, it's said in the book that he, you know, develops a bit more esteem for Billy when he finally believes him. At first he thinks, you know, that he has echolalia or that he's just not being truthful. Once he accepts the fact that Billy was indeed there, he starts to put a bit more esteem and that's why he deigns to have this conversation at all with Billy. Um, but then Billy says something about going to other planets and I'd like to hear the rest of that conversation, but we don't get it. <clears throat> After he's uh, sent back home, Billy uh, has like a live-in nurse who takes care of him, but he sneaks out. He sneaks off to New York to try to get onto TV. Um, after checking into his hotel room, uh, he goes down to Times Square looks in the window of a tawdry bookstore. So tawdry would be, you know, it's like a, it's like an adult bookstore. In the window were hundreds of books about effing and buggery and murder. I'm not dropping F-bombs, guys. <laughs> this is gonna be on YouTube. <laughs> and a street guide to New York City. Yeah, you know. <laughs> uh, okay. A street guide to New York City and a model of the Statue of Liberty with a thermometer on it. Also in the window, speckled with soot and fly shit, were four paperback novels by Billy's friend Kilgore Trout. Ah, so he looks into the adult bookstore and he finds Kilgore Trout's novels. That's a thing that we hear about in some other books as well. Uh, poor Kilgore could never get properly published except for in really shady publications. Um, the news of the day, meanwhile, was being written in ribbons of lights on a building to Billy's back. The window reflected the news. It was about power and sports and anger and death. So it goes. So there again, it's just the, the very mention of death. So it goes. Billy goes into the adult bookstore. Um, he wasn't beguiled by the back of the bookstore. So the back of this adult bookstore has a peep show where you can see dirty films. Uh, he was thrilled by the Kilgore Trout novels in the front. The titles were all new to him, or he thought they were. Now he opened one. It seemed all right for him to do that. Everyone else in the store was pawing things, like with their hands, you know, touching. <clears throat> yeah, pawing. The paw is like shapitza. <laughs> <clears throat> so they were pawing things, like, you know, like a, like a dog would go. <laughs> the name of the book was The Big Board. He got a few paragraphs into it, and then he realized he had read it before, years ago, in the veterans' hospital. Hmm. So if you're going on the theory that this is all in his head, then this would be possible evidence of that. He gets, he's like, oh, I know this book. No, actually, I've read it before. In the hospital with Elliot Rosewater. 
it was about an earthling, man and woman, who were kidnapped by extraterrestrials. Huh, sounds familiar. So this could be where he's getting his reality from. <clears throat> uh, they were put on display in a zoo on a planet called Zircon 212. Um, more of the story. The fictitious people in the zoo had a big board showing stock market quotes and commodity prices and a news ticker and a phone supposedly connected to a brokerage on Earth, like a stock brokerage where they sell, they buy and sell stocks and futures. Uh, futures are uh, never mind. It's not important. Futures are when you invest in things like sugar and, and wheat. Uh, the creatures on Zircon 212 told their captives that they had invested a million dollars for them back on Earth, and it was up to the captives to manage it so they would be fabulously wealthy when they returned to Earth. Uh, of course, it was all fake. It's, this is just there to provoke them, right? They were stimulants to make the earthlings perform vividly for the crowds at the zoo, make them jump up and down and cheer or gloat or sulk or tear their hair to be scared shitless or to feel as contented as babies in their mother's arms. <laughs> it's, it's pretty cruel. Um, the earthlings did well on paper. That was part of the rigging, of course. Religion got mixed up in it, too. The news ticker reminded them the president of the United States had declared National Prayer Week and that everybody should pray. The Earthlings had had a bad week on the market before that. They lost a small fortune in olive oil futures. So they gave pray praying a whirl. It worked. <laughs> so the alien uh, captors see them praying and increase the prices. Uh, all for show, just like Billy's Trough Midorian life. Interestingly, the Trough Midorians are watching <laughs> dirty performances by Billy and his wife and his partner. Another Kilgore Trout book there in the window uh, was about a man who built a time machine to go back and see Jesus. It worked. And he saw Jesus when he was 12 years old. Jesus was learning the carpentry, tra carpentry trade from his father. Uh, Roman soldiers came to the shop with a mechanical drawing of a device they wanted built by sunrise the next morning. It was a cross to be used in execution of a rabble rouser. That's a troublemaker, somebody who's rousing the rabble. The rabble would be the, I don't know, uh, let's say rebellious crowd, the rabble, the, the mob, that would be the rabble. Uh, Jesus and his father built the cross. They were glad to have the work. <laughs> The rabble rouser was executed on it. So there's irony here, right? Uh, as this would be the way that Jesus was executed later on. So it goes. They were glad to have the work. Hmm. Uh, Billy skipped to the end of the book where the hero mingled with people who were taking Jesus down from the cross. He went up the ladder first, dressed in period clothes, leaned close to Jesus so people couldn't see him use his stethoscope, and he listened. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't a sound inside the emaciated chest cavity. The son of God was dead as a doornail. So it goes. So uh, separate long conversation that could be had about that kind of confirmation and what it would actually do to people's beliefs. Uh, it would kind of reduce, you know, the whole act of believing into just the banal act of seeing a, you know, some facts that are written down, like, hey, look at that chair. <laughs> uh, not a controversial position. Anyway, let's not get into that right now. Maybe we can maybe talk about that in the, the final episode. So yeah, he finds that Christ indeed died on the cross. Uh, the time traveler whose name was Lance Corwin also got to measure the length of Jesus, but not to weigh him. Jesus was five feet, three and a half inches tall. That's very short. Um, <laughs> it's uh, What would that be in meters? It's like a meter and a half, not even a meter and a half. Oh. Five feet tall. My, my mother's five feet tall. And she's, I guess that doesn't help you because you've never met her. <laughs> she's not a tall lady. Anyway, Jesus is apparently quite short. 
uh, it's a, one of those unexpected facts. <laughs> he wasn't expecting to find out Jesus's height. Uh, Okay, so the bookstore owners, when Billy goes to buy the Kilgore Trout books, uh, the cashier is startled when he sees what Billy's book is. <laughs> what Billy's, like he's carrying Kilgore Trout stuff. He says, Jesus Christ, where'd you find this thing? And so on. <laughs> he had to tell the other clerks about the pervert who wanted to buy the window dressing. <laughs> uh, the other clerks already knew about Billy. They had been watching him too. Uh, the cash register where Billy waited for his change was near a bin of old girly magazines. So he finds out more about Montana wild hack. <clears throat> Turns out she wasn't just any film star. She was doing blue movies as they used to say. And as he says in this book, blue movies is kind of an old term for pornographic films. Uh, so he waited for his change near the, the bin of girly magazines and he sees what really became of Montana Wild Hack? I'm a little bit curious as to how it is that uh, she just got abducted, but Billy manages to be everywhere. Like his life doesn't get interrupted. I guess Montana doesn't. Well, yeah, we know that she doesn't time travel because on the ship, she always says, I see you've been time traveling. Um, why do the owners call him a pervert? <laughs> This is in the adult bookstore where people are pawing everything. Um, <laughs> why do they consider Billy a pervert? No wrong answers. <laughs> what, is per what does pervert mean for these guys? What do they mean by pervert? I mean, this is a, a store where the guy has that. There, mm -hmm. there was some uh, story about uh, Egyptian and uh, some uh, oral genital contact from Egyptian to a present day. Yeah. yeah, it was like a history. He found that book. Right. But that's not the book he's carrying to the register. He's carrying, he found the Kilgore Trout books. And that's why these guys call him a pervert. They're like, why are you buying these science fiction books? You pervert? He's, they say he's buying the window dressing because those books were just on the display. And not for this book. Yeah, not for the, like, that was something that was near the register when he's paying. But they're like, why are you buying this? You're, you're still muted, Nevena. I see you talking. And now? Yeah, there you go. Uh, I can uh, connect this uh, word uh, pervert. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if we can remember the part uh, with the weird photo of the animal and the, some girl yes. in some Greek. Yes. Uh, maybe the symbol of uh, pervert uh, uh, how to say interruptions maybe it's some contrast or a connection with uh, uh, how to say um, untidiness of slaughterhouse and this disaster of the this bombing of Dresden and so tra traumatic and absurdity of the whole situation in the, this uh, 3rd February of the 1945 it's uh, maybe some kind of uh, how to uh, um, Irony. Relation of the the this whole um, uh, situation and uh, some kind of uh, uh, untidiness or something weird or I don't know, abnormal. Sure. <clears throat> yeah, we could say if we want to look at the big picture that uh, it's ironic that he's a pervert while all of the terrible things happen in, in Dresden and in the war in general. Um, sure. But we have to kind of realize that these guys, <clears throat> they call him a pervert because he's not doing the thing that he's supposed to do. And in this case, what he's supposed to do is be a pervert. But, <laughs> but 
because he's not doing the right kind of perversion. That's the thing. He's, you know, he's supposed to be watching the dirty movies and, you know, buying the dirty magazines and looking at the dirty pictures. He's not supposed to be buying science fiction. He's doing the wrong thing in the wrong place. And uh, there's something to this <clears throat> that really, I don't know, hit home for me. It's uh, this idea that there's a proper time and place for everything. Uh, there's a joke in English that says, there's, there's a time and a place for everything. It's called college. <laughs> anyway, that's the joke. Um, <clears throat> Billy is not doing the right thing in the right place at the right time, right? They're expecting him to do the stuff we would normally call perverted, but he's breaking the rules. He's breaking the rules by not doing the thing that we would normally call perverted. So he's perverse in the sense that he's not following the rules and that's it. So even these guys who live, <clears throat> a, let's say a life that's kind of on the margins of society, you know, it's not a mainstream thing, especially at this time, to have an adult, <laughs> an adult bookstore with a peep show. These are people who would live sort of on the margins of, of civilization. Um, but for them, <clears throat> there's still even a kind of rule of conformity. You have to conform. You have to do what you're supposed to do. If you don't, you're a pervert. <laughs> and that's, that's the, the big sin, right? He's not doing what he's supposed to do inside the dirty bookshore, bookstore. <laughs> it's funny. I found it very funny. This pervert is buying science fiction in here. How dare he? Um, yeah, and uh, we do get to see the picture is, in fact, here in the store. And uh, another twist, calling back to, as Vonnegut loves to call back to previous parts of the book, uh, Billy catches a glimpse of one of the peep shows. It says he didn't want to see what happened next. He sees Montana Wild Hack, actually, in the glimpse of one of the peep shows. She's eating a banana. <laughs> he didn't want to see what happened next. And the clerk importuned him, said, hey, come on over here, to come over and see some really hot stuff they kept under the counter for connoisseurs. A connoisseur is someone who really appreciates things, uh, who really appreciates something in particular, right? like a wine connoisseur or a cigar connoisseur or a dirty picture connoisseur. <laughs> Billy, connoisseur. what is it? Perfume. A perfume connoisseur, yes. Uh, Billy was mildly curious as to what could be kept hidden in a place like this. <laughs> Everything's out in the open. What could you possibly be hiding? So the clerk leered and showed him. So leering is like, yee. <laughs> It was a photograph of the woman and the pony. It's the same picture. So that picture comes back for us. Uh, yeah, attempting to have sexual intercourse between Doric columns in front of velvet draperies, which were fringed with deedle, deedly balls. Uh, uh, it's like a fringe that hangs from some fabric that, you know, hangs down like this. Anyway. <laughs> yes, the picture reappears as the... Uh, the smut of the smut inside of the dirty bookstore. Uh, <clears throat> Billy didn't manage to get on TV that night. There is a thing where it says he just went and was flipping through the television stations, trying to find one that might take him. <laughs> That's kind of funny by itself. Uh, in the US, there are still some places that have uh, local public television but mostly it's gone. Local public television allowed really anybody to go on television if you, had the, if you wanted to put in the effort, um, but it was in the middle of the night at like three o'clock in the morning. So it says that he was looking for someone who would take him, but <clears throat> there was nothing, uh, he said they hadn't gotten to the part of the night where they would show someone like him. <laughs> uh, it was still too early and they were just showing, uh, they were showing murder and silliness. No, that's like that time of the evening, not time of the evening for people who have seen aliens or something like that. So he goes to a radio talk show 
and hilariously they assume that he's a, uh, a literary critic <laughs> just i don't know based on his appearance <clears throat> because there were some other literary critics there and they were all getting ready to speak. Uh, yeah, he goes up the elevator. There are other people up there waiting to go in. <clears throat> They're going to discuss whether the novel was dead or not. So it goes. See, he's being funny with his use of so it goes because he said, the novel is dead. Uh, <laughs> This, they mean the novel as an art form is dead. I like this part of the book because uh, <clears throat> at the time that this was published, that was, and other times even before this, but that was a discussion that was happening. Is the novel dead, right? Is it done? <clears throat> is there, are there going to be no more novels? Uh, that that conversation still happens today, actually, but people still ri keep writing them. Um, so they led him onto the panel with other literary critics. And here are some things that they say. Uh, so first of all, he sits with them. Uh, they ask him what paper he's from. And he says the Ilium Gazette. Uh, he's nervous and happy. If you're ever in Cody, Wyoming, just ask for Wild Bob. I put that here because it comes up again later. And I think it came up once before, didn't it? I mean, I know we had Wild Bob already. I'm not talking about him. It's funny, though, that he says this here. Um, so here's the discussion they have. And this is very, I think this is Kurt being very just uh, sarcastic about the conversation that people were really having at the time that he published this or at the time he was writing it. <clears throat> so Billy puts his hand up at the beginning not called on right away. Others get ahead, got in ahead of him. One of them said it would be a nice time to bury the novel. Now that a Virginian, 100 years after App Appomattox, had written Uncle Tom's Cabin. Okay. Uh, that's uh, Appomattox is one of the last battles of the Civil War. Uh, another one said that people couldn't read well enough anymore to turn print into exciting situations in their skulls. <laughs> so that authors had to do what Norman Mailer did, which was to perform in public what he had written. Okay, that's another take. Uh, the master of ceremonies asked people to say what they thought the function of a novel might be in modern society. One critic said, to provide touches of color in rooms with white walls. <laughs> so basically he's saying novels in the future will be purely decorative. <clears throat> another one said, uh, to describe blowjobs artistically. <laughs> Another one said, to teach wives of junior executives what to buy next and how to act in a French restaurant. <laughs> so he's being sarcastic. Kurt is. He's making fun of the conversation about, about novels, whether they're dead or not. Um, I thought it was very nice to include this. It's him saying, these conversations are stupid. <laughs> the conversations that people are having about this topic are stupid. Um, and then Billy was allowed to speak. Off he went in that beautifully trained voice of his talk, telling about flying saucers and Montana wild hack and so on. He was gently expelled from the studio during a commercial. <laughs> went back to his hotel room, put a quarter into the magic fingers machine, connected to his bed, and went to sleep. Then he traveled back to Trofamador. Okay. Um, he mentioned he mentions to Montana that he had seen part of a blue movie. Like I said, that's the old term. You don't hear it very often these days. Blue meant shocking. Uh, it wasn't. It meant dirty in the 1960s and the 1950s. It was not re restricted to movies. You could say blue humor. Uh, do you guys know who Lenny Bruce was? Lenny Bruce was a famous comedian in the 1960s, uh, 1950s and 60s. My dates are confused, but he was a, one of the first famous blue comedians. He was shocking because, you know, in his comedy act, he swore and he told stories about sex and things that people didn't talk about. And uh, he was, you know, he was a public enemy because of that. <clears throat> 
Anyway, uh, Billy mentioned that he had seen her in part of a blue movie. Her response was no less casual than his. It was Trophamadorian and guilt-free. So she has, by the way, this tells us she has totally adjusted to life in the zoo. <clears throat> so she doesn't feel uh, any shame or anything. She's totally at peace with her with her life. <clears throat> she says, yeah, and I heard about you in the war and what a clown you were. Uh, and I've heard about your high school teacher who was shot. He made a blue movie with a firing squad. She moved the baby from one breast to the other because the moment was structured that she had to do so. Uh, anybody notice something about this? Uh, Billy, okay, aside from sunning himself in the back of that cart, uh, Billy here is happy, right? Or maybe he's hiding inside of a delusion from the reality of the, of the world. Um, in both cases, though, he's happy let's say, but even in this, you know, fantastic environment, he still doesn't pay any attention to his, his child. <laughs> he doesn't do it for his other son, the Green Beret. He has a very cold, well, cool, distant relationship with his son in, on Earth. But even here, he doesn't interact with the baby at all. It's just something to note. Uh, there was silence. They're playing with the clocks again, said Montana, rising, preparing to put the baby into its crib. She meant their keepers were making the electric clocks in the dome go fast, then slow, then fast again, uh, watching a little earthling family through peepholes. Um, that's also something that Kurt says at the beginning of the story when he talks about uh, in chapter one that the clocks, the clocks were not behaving properly, something like that. All right. Uh, there was a silver chain around her neck. Hanging from it between her breast was a locket containing a photograph of her alcoholic mother. A grainy thing, soot and chalk. Uh, it could have been anybody. Engraved on the outside of the locket were these words. So uh, this is the serenity prayer. It came up earlier in the book. By the way, Kurt Vonnegut himself did all these little drawings. Uh, there are other drawings in other books too. So we mentioned it before, the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom always to tell the difference. Ironic, right? I mean, what can he... Well, what can we say about this locket? It has a picture of um, her drenched mother on one side mm -hmm. and uh, the other side, uh, some uh, saying from Bible. It's called the serenity prayer. Yeah, that's true. But why, what does it have to do with our story? What does it have to do with Billy? Or what does it not have to do with Billy? <laughs> so, you know. I mean, uh, by the way, that, that, that serenity prayer is one that's used uh, in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, which is, uh, it's an organization to get people to stop drinking. So it is a thing that, that they use. So it's also, you know, maybe a reference to that. But <clears throat> uh, Billy, <laughs> okay, courage to change the things I can. <laughs> what can he change? Nothing, nothing at all. So you're kind of like stuck trying to think about this, like, okay, <clears throat> uh, courage to change the things I can. Uh, hang on, let me get the wording right. Uh, yeah, serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Of course, the serenity prayer. <clears throat> That first one, serenity to accept the things I cannot change, that's the end of the prayer for him, <laughs> right? That should be, you know, serenity to accept the things I cannot change, tachka. That's, his, that's the end for him, right? <laughs> uh, 
um, maybe the wisdom to know the difference, but maybe it does, it's probably not wisdom for him, or maybe it is. I don't know. Maybe he has the ultimate wisdom. And the ultimate wisdom is that you can't change anything. <laughs> so you don't need courage, right? That's totally him, right? He doesn't have courage because he doesn't need courage. Why would he need courage? He's strapped to the railroad track <laughs> going, you know, with, unable to steer, unable to do anything. So yeah, the, the, the serenity prayer for Billy, it has, you know, a very different meaning. I mean, it must, if he's even thought about it. We heard about the serenity prayer earlier in the book. In his office, he has a copy, like a poster of it in his office. And people are like, that, that prayer helps me get through the day sometimes. <laughs> and he could say, the first part does for me. <laughs> um, yeah, it's... Uh, I mean, we're probably going to talk about this in the final session as well, but <clears throat> the whole idea of, of free will not existing really changes all the ethical boundaries. Um, <clears throat> can there even be such a thing as responsibility for one's actions if there's no such thing as, as free will? Can there be any such thing as courage if he is just riding along a victim of his own experience. So yeah, a lot of irony there. Um, in the final chapter, the epilogue, uh, pretty much the epilogue doesn't say that, but it kind of is, it's very short. And we return to Kurt Vonnegut in the first person. <clears throat> okay, you know, he doesn't say Kurt Vonnegut, but we can assume it's Kurt Vonnegut. <laughs> Uh, he starts off saying Robert Kennedy was just shot, you know, eight miles from where I live. He died last night. So it goes Martin Luther King was shot a month ago. He died too. So it goes every day. My government gives me a count of corpses created by military science in Vietnam. So it goes, my father died many years ago now of natural causes. So it goes, he was a sweet man. He was a gun nut too. He left me his guns they rust <clears throat> even his what sweet does mean nut, nut. Uh, a gun nut actually it's better to learn gun nut a nut is you know like kikiriki like <laughs> uh, but a, a nut as slang means a crazy person oh, okay. like oh that guy's nuts like he's ludak right oh, ludak. so he's like a uh, ludak for guns a gun nut is somebody who really is, loves guns, just can't get enough of them. Um, so his father, his sweet father, was also a gun nut and left, left his guns. Um, there's some irony there as well, you know, all these people being shot in a very short period of time. And his father probably never <laughs> had, you know, a reason or ever did shoot anyone. I mean, I guess we would have heard of it, but you know, who knows? Um, so yeah, even his sweet father has all these guns, you know, these killing devices and leaves them as an inheritance and the inheritance, the inheritance rusts. Uh, Antrofamador, says Billy, there isn't much, much interest in Jesus Christ. Uh, the earthling figure that they are most interested in is Darwin, who taught that those who die are meant to die, that corpses are improvements. So it goes. Um, like evolution. Yeah, evolution. So it makes sense that a Trophamadorian would see things that way because they have no particular... Uh, opinions about <laughs> people dying. Sure, they're dead now, but they're alive three days ago. So they're still alive now <laughs> for the Trifamidorian. Yeah, corpses are improvements. Um, 
if what Billy learned is true, we'll all live forever, no matter how dead we are. <laughs> I'm not overjoyed. <laughs> um, I think I talked about this in one of the earlier sessions, but eternal recurrence. There's this idea that Nietzsche has of, you know, living your life in such a way that you would be thrilled if you found out that you were going to just live it over and over again. Um, uh, Kurt's not overjoyed about that possibility. Still, if I'm gonna spend every eternity visiting this moment and that, I'm grateful to say so many of these moments are nice. Uh, one of the nicest ones was his trip back to Dresden. So this novel goes in a full circle. Like we come back to the beginning. <clears throat> where he talks about his trip to Dresden with O'Hare. Um, there were six other passengers on their little plane. They were having nice times too. East Germany was down below and the lights were on. I imagine dropping bombs on those lights, those little villages and cities and towns. Uh, just a kind of, I guess, perverse instinct that comes from being a military <laughs> person. I don't know. I guess little kids would do the same thing. <laughs> uh, O'Hare and I never expected to make any money. And here we were now, extremely well-to-do. Well-to-do means that they have a decent amount of money. They're not worried about money. Uh, Kurt says, if you're ever in Cody, <clears throat> just ask for Wild Bob. Okay. So we get this occasional <clears throat> reference to that thing that Wild Bob said. Um, why? <laughs> What's the point of this reference? In the first, okay, just to remind you, Wild Bob was a general, a corporal, I forget. He was one of the commanders looking for his crew. Roland was one of them, <clears throat> but they were all dead except for Roland. And he's like, where are my boys? And uh, he says, he invites uh, the, the survivors of the war to come and find him. And he tells them he's gonna throw a huge barbecue and it's gonna be great. Uh, if you're ever there, just ask for Wild Bob. And he goes off and he dies of pneumonia. Uh, he's kind of the actualized version of Roland Weary. Roland Weary is awful though, you know, he's just a terrible person. But Wild Bob was, the real deal, let's say. Uh, he gave himself the name Wild Bob because he wanted people to call him that. He wanted to be seen as Wild Bob. You know, that's the comparison to Roland where Roland wanted to be one of the three musketeers, right? He had this romanticized vision of himself. Um, but yeah, Wild Bob for all his... Uh, Bravado? I don't know. Uh, didn't make it. And what are the two situations where Billy and Kurt say this phrase? Do you remember what was Billy doing when he said when he said that phrase? If you're ever in what was the city again? If you're ever in Cody, yeah. If you're ever in Cody, Wyoming, just ask for Wild Bob. What was Billy doing? Do you guys remember? It's just in the last chapter. He was waiting to go on to the radio station, right? He was nervous. He also says it at one point when he's sleeping, I think, in the hospital. I have to go back and check. Not right now. <clears throat> so, okay. In the first case... Billy says it because he's nervous. It gives him courage. That's what Wild Bob had at that moment, you know? Even though Wild Bob was not in the best of shape, even though Wild Bob was not destined to make it out of that situation, uh, he was still thinking forward to the great times that would be had at this huge barbecue that he was going to throw for everyone. He was looking forward to it. Couldn't wait. Um, 
so there's you know this maybe comfort that comes from that i don't know for for billy but it's funny because the situations are not the same billy says that when he's nervous because he's going to go on the radio maybe he's summoning up courage there the courage of wild bob but kurt he's not saying it because he's nervous he's saying it to o'hare his old buddy Uh, we find out in several places during the story of Billy that Kurt was there and so was O'Hare. So, you know, we, we know that Billy is a fictional character, but we know that a lot of this is true. Um, in fact, it turns out that Wild Bob might be a real person outside of this book. I've read a little bit about it that there was a person who answered to that name and would have been in the war at the same time as Billy and probably met him. Um, so met Kurt, I mean, <laughs> he wouldn't have met Billy. Um, so yeah, it's a different situation. He's not summoning courage. He's, I don't know, it's nostalgic. He's summoning the past. It's, it's a shared reference. You know how you have inside jokes with close friends of yours? where you can just say the one phrase and that, that friend knows exactly what you mean. And nobody else does. Well, that's the situation here. It's a bit of nostalgia. It's a little bit melancholic for him. They're on the trip. They're on the trip back to Dresden. They're on the trip where they're going to see the slaughterhouse where they were kept prisoner. Um, and he makes the reference. So it's just summoning the past, adding a little nostalgia. Also, nobody else on the plane would understand what that meant, aside from his buddy, O'Hare. Language barriers aside. All right. Uh, O'Hare had a little notebook with postal rates and airline distances and altitudes, other key facts. <clears throat> He came across this fact. On an average, 324,000 new babies are born into the world every day. During that same day, 10,000 persons will have starved to death or died from malnutrition. So it goes. I guess the book didn't say that part. In addition, 123,000 persons will die for other reasons. So it goes. This leaves a net gain of about 191,000 each day in the world. The Population Reference Bureau predicts the world's population will double to 7 billion before 2000. Hmm, that's pretty accurate, right? I suppose they'll all want dignity, I said. I suppose, said O'Hare. Um, what's the point of this little discussion where he says, I suppose they will all want dignity? I mean... Let's face it, the way that he has described his experience of war is as something that's humiliating for everyone involved. <laughs> um, he's being a little bit darkly humorous with O'Hare, right? I guess they're all want, they're going to all want dignity. And O'Hare says, I suppose so. Um, so, you know, what, what would that mean for every single person on the planet to get the dignity that they deserve? Uh, it's no small task. Um, I mean, even in this little blurb of statistics, we find out that 10,000 people die of starvation every day, malnutrition, um, very far from dignity. Okay, um, so prisoners of war from many lands came together that morning at such and such a place in Dresden. Uh, this is back in, in Billy's world. Uh, it had been decreed, so announced, that there were, uh, that here was where digging for bodies was to begin. So the German uh, guards, the remaining people, 
bring them out to do work in the, the ruined city to try to find uh, bodies or survivors. Billy found himself paired uh, as a digger with a Maori. Uh, those are Pacific Island people uh, who had been captured at Tobruk. Uh, the Maori was chocolate brown. He had whirlpool, whirlpools tattooed on his forehead and his cheeks. Billy and the Maori dug into the inert, uncompromising gravel of the moon. The materials were loose, so there were constant little avalanches. Uh, Billy and the Maori and others helping him with their particular hole came at last to a membrane of timbers laced over rocks, which had wedged together to form an accidental dome. I wonder if this is a comparison to the dome in which Billy lives his Trophimidorian life. They made a hole in the membrane. So they find a pocket, like a dome under the rubble, under the wreckage. <clears throat> uh, a German soldier goes down with a flashlight, uh, comes back and says that there are dozens of bodies sitting on benches unmarked. Uh, so basically they found a place where people were trapped and were sitting on benches. So they're, they're not marked, I guess that is to say that they're not burned up or anything. Um, the superior said that the opening in the membrane should be enlarged and a ladder should be put in the hole so that bodies could be carried out. Thus began the first corpse mine in Dresden. Okay, corpse mine. Um, interesting way of putting it. So they're, you know, you know, mine, like, what is it? Rudar? Is that it? What is mine in Serbian? Rudnik. No, that's a miner. Ru mine. Rudar. Rudar, okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, a corpse mine. And they 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 find more of them where they're digging bodies out of the hole. Interestingly, uh Hannah Arendt in the book Origins of Totalitarianism described the uh Nazi killing apparatus as a corpse factory. So there's the corpse mine and the corpse factory. I don't know why I just thought of that. <laughs> um, there were hundreds of corpse mines operating by and by. They didn't smell bad at first. They were wax museums. So basically the corpses were like wax statues. But then the bodies rotted and liquefied and the stink was like roses and mustard gas, like his breath when he was drunk in the beginning. <laughs> so it goes. The Maori died of the dry heaves after having been ordered to go down in that stink and work. He tore himself to pieces, throwing up and throwing up. So it goes. So all terrible. A new technique was devised. Bodies weren't brought up anymore. They were cremated by soldiers with flamethrowers right where they were. The soldiers stood outside the shelters, simply set fire, sent the fire in. Uh, somewhere in the poor old high, sorry, somewhere, in there. Edgar Derby, as we are always hearing about, uh, was finally caught with the teapot he had taken from the catacombs. He was arrested for plundering, that's looting, stealing after the war. He was tried and shot. So we always knew this was coming for him. We've heard about it from the very beginning of the book. It's uh, high irony in this whole thing, that tiny, tiniest thing like a teapot. Uh, causes him to have a court formed, <laughs> you know, a little military tribunal forms to put him on trial in all of this wreckage. They actually try him, tried and shot. So they literally made <laughs> a little court session. So it's extremely crazy. Like the entire city is destroyed and they're like, nope, we're gonna have a, <laughs> we're gonna have a hearing. <laughs> And we're going to try this man. And then they say guilty, and then he is executed. Um, so just absurd, completely absurd. Uh, Billy and the rest wandered out into the shady uh, street. The trees were leafing out. There was nothing going on out there, no traffic of any kind. There was only one vehicle, an abandoned wagon drawn by two horses. The wagon was green and coffin shaped. That's the one. Birds were talking. <clears throat> One bird said to Billy Pilgrim, Pooty Wheat. Okay, that Pooty Wheat. Well, let's talk about that for a sec. <laughs> uh, 
why? What can we say about that bird song? This bird song were uh, around uh, uh, this um, prison for uh, Americans. Mm -hmm. So what do you think they're doing in the story though? That bird the song. Life uh, is going uh, without wow. us. Life is going on. Good. That's right. Life goes on. That's a big but part of it. Also, also, when you, you mentioned bird song, I um, make some connection. Uh, some kind that of, this is uh, part of with the band, some the song, something like that. Maybe it's connection with the, some. Uh, oh, you mean the. Um, uh, wealth, uh, tree wealth with the money, with the song, with some uh, Im imaginable, uh, how to say, a pleasant uh, beginning of new life and uh, maybe something like that i don't know uh, so like uh like some kind of hope you mean hope i like if something okay of no that's good i like that too yeah there's actually a lot that we can get out of this this little bird uh <laughs> because uh okay first of all it's a, a, a bird that you might not even notice in the city. So one thing it does is it points out to us how everything is gone. You can hear that little bird. Like there are no cars, <laughs> there's nothing there, right? It's just all wrecked, all destroyed. That's one thing that it does. I think it's very, there's a lot here. So it shows us that the city is desolated, just uh, quiet. Secondly, it's like a question. It's like the bird is asking a question. That's another thing we can get out of it. See, look, it's got a question mark. Yes. So what do you think that bird is asking? So the bird could be asking so many things. The bird could be asking, what happened? <laughs> what, what is this? Like that, that could be the question. <laughs> What is this? They're not, they're not reply for that question, actually. Yeah. Not <laughs> yeah. Smart reply. There's and, no uh, good reply. Yeah. Yeah, that's like, um, like you said, uh, it's a tragic absurdity of this war mm. and this massacre. Yes. And, um, so that's how it's ending with questions and not yeah. or not answer. That's a lot of questions and not answer. Smart answer. No That's smart, it. nothing to say. Very good. That was the next thing I was going to talk about. This ties back to the beginning of the book where he tells, he says it a couple of times, but he says, there's nothing to say. There's nothing smart you can say about a massacre. It's nonsense. It's absurd. It's terrible. It's just, there's no, there are no words. Um, by the way, also, that's a big part of the plague, which we did last time. There are no words. Their language is not sufficient to get to the description of this kind of absurdity and, and horror. Um, so yeah, you get the fact that the city was quiet. You get the hope, as you guys were saying, like something mm -hmm. new will grow. You get uh, you get the question, what the hell is happening? What happened to the city? You get also look. <clears throat> so it goes has the same syllable count. So it goes. So so it goes as a question. I so think it it's the same. Uh, so it goes. Uh, this uh, uh, birds uh, say on uh, her language. So it goes. Yes, and as a question, right? <clears throat> yeah, that's what I'm saying. It could be. Maybe, so it goes. Maybe the bird uh, just uh, ask uh, um, itself. Uh, what was going on about this Trafalgar? What was? Is it normal to go <laughs> back, like uh, with flying saucer, through this trauma? And is it normal, or well, is, uh, is it imagine imagination? What I don't was know if going the, on? Yeah, I don't know if Billy's told the bird yet. <laughs> maybe he'll maybe he'll tell the bird now. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, it does certainly refer to a absurdity and that that that's a choice that kurt vonnegut made too because normally when people write a bird's song or a sound in a book they write tweet tweet 
right? That's the normal, quote unquote, normal way to say it. But no, he took a very specific phrase that is never used except by him. He made a new phrase, budiwit. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's absurd. It doesn't make any sense. Like tweet, tweet kind of makes sense just because it follows the rules. But budiwit doesn't follow the rules. It's, uh, it steps away from the, the rules of how you would describe. Uh, you know, if you write bird songs, bird sounds in writing, it's tweet, tweet, or caw, caw, or something like that or cock a doodle doo if it's a rooster, <laughs> um, but not putty wheat. So it's breaking the rules for a reason. All right. Well, that is the end of our story. Um, our story has come to a close, so it goes. Uh, next time, we're just going to be talking uh, about really connected themes to the book. We'll probably talk about free will a little bit i would encourage you guys to you know email me some suggestions we'll also probably talk about the next uh book uh it's not starting immediately because we're going to promote it for a couple of weeks so we can get some more people um i've already made a bit of a list and what we're going to do is uh have people vote on the list and that will be the way that we choose the next book. Um, yeah, so it should be fun. And uh, like I said, if there's a book you would like to contribute, we have to keep it relatively short. Uh, there are a couple of books that are long-ish, but like nothing, we try to keep it under 300 pages uh, because, well, as you can see, people for some reason don't usually make it to the end of the book club. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we don't want to, you know, have one that lasts for three months with nobody attending. We'd like to do them shorter, so they're smaller commitments for people. Um, although if we pick a slightly longer book, something around 300 pages, then the book club will probably be longer than six weeks, really seven weeks altogether. Um, it'll probably be something more like, you know, eight or nine weeks at least. But I hope that uh, you guys will come back for the next one. We're trying to build up a core group that will attend regularly um, because that would be good. You know, the world doesn't have enough reading groups. <laughs> Everything out there is pretty awful. <laughs> So much of the time, it's really nice to have a little something like this, you know? Um, okay, but yeah, next week we'll talk about that some and we'll talk about some related themes. And yeah, please email me if you would like to either contribute a book suggestion or if you would like to contribute a topic. I mean, you don't have to email me for that. You can just suggest it during the, uh, the meeting, but it's cool if you email me first because I can maybe find and some you will send us email uh, about that list and uh, what that when uh, will be the that new book uh, uh, beginning of the well class. we haven't <clears throat> we haven't decided a date yet but we still have one more session here and then it'll probably be two weeks after that because we want to promote it okay. um, so it's not immediately but yeah anyway I will see you guys next week, next Wednesday, for our final talk. All right. OK. Please come back next Wednesday. I hope to see you there. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye, guys. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.